Um, welcome, uh, everyone, to the Biodefense Policy Seminar Series. Uh, my name is Gregory Koblenz. I'm Deputy Director of the Biodefense Program. And on behalf of the Biodefense Program and the Department of Public Natural Affairs, I welcome you today. Uh, we are going to hear um, from uh, Paul Walker about Syria and chemical weapons, building a uh, world free of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, Dr. Walker is the Director of the uh, Environment and Security and Sustainability Program at Global Green USA, which is the U.S. branch of Green Cross International. Uh, he's been working on non-proliferation, uh, specifically chemical weapons, for over uh, three decades. And um, among his many um, achievements is he was, uh, took part in the first on-site inspection of the Russian chemical weapons stockpile at uh, Shuchi in 1994. Um, and since then, he's worked closely with the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons which, as some of you might know, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize uh, this year. Um, and um, uh, Dr. Walker has taken also a very active role in promoting uh, the role of civil society in nonproliferation. And a few years ago, he helped establish a, a new NGO called the uh, CWC Coalition, which is an international NGO uh, network that supports the Chemical Weapons Convention and the OPCW. Uh, in recognition of his uh, work uh, uh, to rid the world of, of chemical weapons. Uh, this year he was the recipient of the uh, Righteous Livelihood Award, which uh, is also known as the Alternative Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, so this is a, a very high honor uh, that he's received and it reflects his, um, not just years, but decades of work uh, on, this, on this topic. Um, and, uh, and so he comes today to talk to us specifically about the situation in Syria, but also its broader implications for the abolition of uh, weapons of mass destruction. So without further ado, Dr. Walker. Make sure my mic is on. <clears throat> so thank you, thank you, Greg. It's good to good to be here at uh, George Mason University. Um, my only challenge is when I come from I live I live in downtown Washington D.C. When I come from Washington D.C., it's always a question of finding my way around the campus here. So I have to carry my map and <clears throat> ask many students and faculty here, where's Mason Hall, or where's Innovation Hall, or where's Robinson Hall, different, different uh, places I've, I've talked in. Let me ask first, are there any students here from uh, Anne Harrington's uh, non-proliferation class? A couple of you, okay, yeah, that's great. So you, so you listened to me last week when I, when I talked. Okay, so hopefully this won't be, it won't, actually won't be too repetitive, but it will be a little bit, so, um, but thank you for, for coming again. What I want to do tonight is uh, talk about Syria a bit. I'll lead off on Syria, but then I want to shift uh, into the background of chemical weapons. And as Greg knows as well, uh, this is an area which is a bit esoteric for most people. <clears throat> and it's a bit, we find out uh, with all the press uh, interviews we're, we're getting around Syria and chemical weapons, uh, we're finding that much of the media doesn't know much about it either. And I always joke that uh, to us, the, the four letters, OPCW, you know, so just rolls off the lips and the, the, the tongue because we've talked about it so much. But most people uh, say, you know, OPC what? Or if you're in the media, I've done many television interviews the last few weeks and the media will say, what's that, what's that international organization? Some, it's in Europe someplace, is it? I said, it's OPCW, you know, Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. So I'll talk about that too. <clears throat> but we're very, very fortunate in, in many ways, ironically, to have the Syrian crisis in the current situation because it's now raised attention to chemical weapons. And this is a whole class of weapons of mass destruction, the most likely to be used by terrorists, uh, much more so, I think, than biological agents or nuclear weapons. The only thing that might rival it would be radioactive materials uh, for dirty, dirty radioactive bombs. And yet, there's almost no attention to this. I mean, when I came in to uh, Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam, uh, which I do three or four times a year to visit and work with the OPCW, um, once again, the, the passport you know, guy said to me, <clears throat> where are you going? And I said, I'm going to The Hague, which is just a half hour train ride down the road. And he said, what's there? I said, the OPCW. And he said, OPC what? And I said to him, you know, you're here as a customs agent. You're supposed to be protecting us. Here, actually, even in the Netherlands, where you've got the major multilateral organization called the OPCW, which is trying to build a world free of chemical weapons and prohibit trade and transfers in chemical agents at all. And you don't even know the name of it, you know. So we've talked about that a lot at the OPCW, how we how we build more public awareness, and particularly uh, expertise amongst customs and border patrols, 
and expertise even within the, uh, the chemical engineering and chemical and biochemical world. I mean, I think most uh, chemists, biochemists, and chemical engineers have never also even heard of the LPCW or even the Chemical Weapons Commission. So let me let me jump into uh, my presentation. I have I have 30 odd slides. Uh, this can be a very complicated discussion, but I'll try not to make it so. I'll try to make it very user friendly. Uh, and uh, please stop me if there's anything on in, any individual slide which is very unclear, <clears throat> or just let me roll through and we'll, we'll stop and have Q&A, you know, and discussion at the end. So, alleged use in Syria. Um, most people think about the August 21st attack, but if you go back in time over the two and a half year civil war in Syria, you really see that there are at least a half dozen alleged uses of chemical weapons. And I'm not going into all the specifics on each one, but you'll see all the way back to uh, July 23rd, oh, well over a year ago, uh, Syria itself confirmed for the first time I know of publicly that in fact it has chemical weapons. Now we knew that it had not joined the Chemical Weapons Convention along with a couple other countries we'll talk about later, um, but it had never really publicly confirmed. So on July 23rd, 2012, it publicly said we have a chemical weapon stockpile so we'll watch out, threatening the, uh, the rebel groups. And then the first time that I'm aware of, uh, there were allegations that a few people were killed. In this case, the Holmes attack in uh, December 23rd, uh, you know, what, 10, 11, 10, 11 months ago, 10, 9, nine 10 months ago. Um, <clears throat> then we realized, in fact, chemical weapons were probably being used in some fashion. So December 23rd, March 19th, March 24th, April 13th, and then April 29th in various places, um, some of them very close to uh, Damascus. Um, the OPCW is there, uh, has been there, uh, for some time now, as you know, a couple of weeks, trying to do inspections on these additional sites and allegations. And I'm not sure what sites they've inspected yet, but there will be a second United Nations slash OPCW report come out uh, on, um, on these uh, additional allegations. And who knows what, what it'll say. It's a long time since the allegations were made, so it, it could be very difficult to prove anything. And then see a serious accession to, this, to the Chemical Weapons Commission. <clears throat> um, you know, the big thing that brought this all about really was the August 21st attack, where we saw in the middle of the night uh, in the eastern suburbs of Damascus, we saw somewhere over 1,400 people killed. And, and from all the videos you've seen on, on TV, um, these were mostly civilians, as far as I know. Uh, at least 400 of them were children uh, killed in their beds at night. And the ones who survived uh, were coming in choking and frothing at the mouth and, you know, had pinpoint uh, eyeballs and, and, and the like, it really, it really indicated use of a nerve agent. Uh, these are all the symptoms of nerve agent. And so <clears throat> most of us, when we were called by press after that, said, absolutely, this is, this is nerve agent. We don't know who used it. Uh, my personal belief was that it was the uh, Assad regime. Um, but in fact, it was just a horrible, you know, inhumane use of chemical weapons. Not, not to say that the whole civil war is in a horrible situation as well. After the U.S. you know, and President Obama threatened a military attack on September 14th, then uh, Assad you know, acceded to the treaty. And he only did this, obviously, with strong pressure from Russia. A lot of us have been talking with Russian colleagues. Uh, there's been long discussions uh, you know, throughout the Civil War for over, well over a year on what the United States and Russia could do together to get Syria to give up its chemical weapons stockpile. And I think, <clears throat> to a large extent, it was the military threat, but it was also the fact that the major supporter you know, of, of Syria, uh, Russia, came in finally and said, there's only one way to save, basically save yourself, and that is to give up your chemical weapons at this point and hold off the, the, the Western, the U.S. military attack. One month later, October 14th, which uh, was, what, two days ago, um, the uh, the CWC enters into force. So it's a 30-day time clock. Basically, after you accede or ratify the treaty, 30 days later, um, you become uh, liable uh, for all the, the good and the bad under the treaty. So Syria is now the 190th uh, member of the CWC, which is a big historic, historic step forward, much more so than I think a lot of people acknowledge. So let me, let me take a step back, considerably back, about a century actually, 
and first say chemical weapons have been used for centuries in various ways. If you go back to the history of chemical agents, a lot of people have been assassinated in all the religious and <clears throat> ethnic and political wars that have taken place. But the biggest use really was in World War I. And next year, uh, in 2015, we'll actually uh, recognize that there'll be a lot of events. We'll, we'll certainly organize some here. And the, the OPSW in The Hague will also recognize the 100th anniversary to commemorate the, uh, sort of the, the first major use of chemical agents. And it was used by the Germans uh, in Ypres, uh, Belgium. And uh, if some of you probably read the history of this, but uh, the troops back then, French, you know, British, uh, Belgian, others, mostly Europeans, <clears throat> were all victimized by uh, chlorine gas, which, which the Germans used. And they didn't have weapons. It wasn't weaponized. It was actually just canisters of pressurized chlorine gas. And they brought them in and said, this might do the trick, because it was really a trench warfare back then. And chlorine is heavier than air. And so on a nice windy night, you know, they just opened the valves. On the, the Germans did on the chlorine tanks. <clears throat> chlorine drifted 